acute pancreatitis is the topic and the cause of acute pancreatitis is most commonly one of two uh, things. The first one is gallstones and the second one is alcoholism and together they account for about 80 percent of all cases of pancreatitis. And there's a long list of other causes but these are by far the two most common. So what is the reason that pancreatitis is occurring in an in individual? Well, what I'll do is I'll draw a very basic diagram of the pancreas and the duodenum, which is the area of the small intestine that is in close proximity. And running through the pancreas is this duct. And that duct is known as the pancreatic duct. Now normally what happens is the pancreas is responsible for producing digestive enzymes. And these digestive enzymes are produced uh, by the pancreas and they're released into the pancreatic duct. So I'll illustrate them with these orange dots. And then once they're uh, released into the pancreatic duct, eventually they get secreted into the duodenum here. And then in the duodenum in the small intestine, they can play the role of uh, helping with digestion. Now what's important is when while they're in the duct, they're inactive. Once they're in the duodenum, they become active. So I'll illustrate that they're active by circling them in red. Now what happens in pancreatitis is that these enzymes are actually activated while they're inside the pancreas. And what that does is it leads to damage of the actual organ itself. So instead of this scenario, you have a scenario that's more like this. So you have these active enzymes that are damaging the actual tissue of the pancreas. Now, 80% of the time, this just causes some mild inflammation, but 20% of the time, it can cause tissue necrosis. And those are the most severe cases, of course. So what is the symptomatology of pancreatitis in the acute phase? Well, some more classic symptoms, such as upper, upper abdominal pain, in the area of the pancreas, uh, pain that occurs uh, to palpation, abdominal tenderness to palpation. Another very common uh, patient presentation or complaint is that the pain is radiating, pain radiation to the back. And then some nonspecific symptoms such as nausea or vomiting as well. So now let's talk a little bit about the diagnosis. Well, by far the most common tests are amylase lipase, without a doubt. And these, of course, will be elevated. And then if you're going to proceed with imaging studies, the two most common are an abdominal ultrasound or an abdominal CT. This is, of course, a little bit more cost effective. Now, the remainder of the lab tests that are ordered, it's important to remember them in the context of Ranson's criteria. Now, Ranson's criteria is a very important criteria that's used to determine the mortality of a patient who presents with acute pancreatitis. And it's broken up into two categories. There's a first set of uh, lab values that you look upon admission and the next set of lab values are after 48 hours of admission. So the mnemonic I use to remember this is GA law and G is for glucose glucose greater than 200, A is for AST greater than 250, L is for LDH greater than 350, the second A is for age greater than 55 
and then W is for WBC, which is greater than 16,000. After 48 hours, you have another set of lab tests and diagnostic findings. And there's a cartoon called Calvin and Hobbes, so that's how I remember it. C is for calcium, less than 8. H is for hematocrit decrease of greater than 10%. The O is for oxygen, in particular the PaO2 of less than 60. A BUN increase of greater than 5. A base deficit of greater than 4. And finally, sequestration of fluids of greater than 6 liters. So this is part of Ranson's criteria. Now, why is this important? It's important because if you have less than 3 of these upon admission, or less than 3 of these total, the mortality is about 5% or less. But if you have greater than or equal to three of these uh, Ransom's criteria, the, the mortality can be very high, 15 to maybe 20 percent, which is quite significant. So let's look at the treatment now. The cornerstone of treatment of acute pancreatitis involves three things. The first thing is giving IV fluids. The second is something called NPO, which is abbreviation for nil per os and what that just means is that you don't give anything by mouth you don't give the patient any food anything uh, orally and then the third is analgesia because of the pain you give something for that and the most commonly used is morphine recent evidence has shown that when you do start feeding the patient the best outcome is by starting with a low-fat diet so I wanted to mention that. Well, let's turn our attention to some clinical vignettes. 60-year-old man is admitted to the hospital for management of acute pancreatitis. Results of the labs are as follows. Amylase of 1,000, calcium of 8.4, BUN 5, hematocrit 42, WBC 14. Results of serum liver chemistry profiles are within the reference ranges. After 48 hours of fluid therapy and observation, a poor prognosis would be indicated by which of the following lab studies? Well, you basically have to have Ranson's criteria memorized, unfortunately. But if you remember, after 48 hours, you've got that Calvin and Hobbes mnemonic. And the C in the Calvin and Hobbes is calcium. And if you remember, a calcium of less than 8 and that is choice D. So all these other choices are actually not even part of the Ransom's criteria after 48 hours. Next question. Which of the following nutritional management strategies is associated with better outcomes in patients with mild acute pancreatitis whose pain and nausea have resolved? Well remember the cornerstone of the treatment of acute pancreatitis when the patient initially presents is IV fluids, placing the patient NPO, don't give any food by mouth, and finally pain medications to help with the severe abdominal pain. They're saying that once the pain and nausea are resolved, how should you proceed? And Recent uh, studies, recent evidence has suggested that when you do start feeding the patient that the best outcomes occur when you give a low-fat diet and that would be choice C. And then finally, 56-year-old man is admitted to the hospital because of one day history of acute severe cramping abdominal pain that radiated to his back. Pain was constant and exacerbated when he tried to eat some food. Patient attempted to self-medicate with acetaminophen, but with no relief. Pain has slowly worsened, and he has not had anything to eat or drink in over a day. 
On admission to the hospital, serum amylase and lipase levels are elevated. The appropriate therapy is initiated and the patient has improvement in his pain. He's also started on morphine uh, with excellent results. Over the next 24 hours, he remains stable. Follow-up set of blood chemistry show a BUN of 26 and a creatinine of 1 and an unchanged amylase and lipase. A right upper quadrant ultrasound shows gallstones with no ductal dilation. Patients' other medications besides the PCA are diazepam for sleep and diphenhydramine. Most appropriate next step is, well, if this patient still has unchanged amylase lipase, so he's still in pancreatitis. So we're going right back to just the three basics of a pancreatitis uh, treatment, which are IV fluids, which involves hydration, hydration, IV fluids, and then of course avoiding any oral intake, so NPO status, and then pain control. And the pain control, he seems to be getting morphine via this patient-controlled anesthetic, uh, but the other two uh, definitely need to be continued. So that would be choice E. And remembering NPO just stands for nil per os. It just means that you don't give anything by mouth. You don't give any oral intake of food or medications.